volunteering was requested by Lieutenant Colonel Sterling Thomas, Mayor Rashid Williams, James Connell, and separately by Mr. Walter Rees, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sean Gleason, and Lieutenant Colonel Jennifer Williams. And we have participants today, Mr. Walter Rees, Esquire Melina Milazzo, Dr. Stephen Zinakis, and James Connell. And uh, with me this afternoon, I have on my left former president of the commission, uh, Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez, who is also the rapporteur for the uh, United States. We also have with us uh, Commissioner Rosa Maria Ortiz, uh, rapporteur on the rights of the child, Commissioner um, Paolo Vanuki, who is responsible for economic, social, and cultural rights unit. We have also with us both our Executive Secretary Emilio Alvarez and also our Assistant Deputy Secretary uh, Elizabeth um, Abi Meshad. And I am uh, Rosemary Antoine, currently President of the Commission. So welcome to everyone. As in all cases, we will give each of you 20 minutes to speak, to this be distributed however you wish. Afterwards, we will have a few comments from um, us here at the front, and then we will give you perhaps three minutes to t answer some of the questions that we have posed. We will start with the petitioners. Thank you. And the name of this hearing, Human Rights Situation of Persons Deprived of Liberty at the Guantanamo Naval Base Cuba, one of several we have had on this subject. Thank you, Madam President, distinguished members of the commission. Uh, on behalf of myself and our legal team, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak here today on this very important issue, and thank you for your time and for your attention. The situation, the ongoing situation in Guantanamo and the human rights violations that continue to this day are an affront to all civilized nations, an affront to internationally recognized norms of humanitarian treatment of all prisoners. The military commissions at Guantanamo Bay, make no mistake, were designed for the specific purpose of warehousing and killing victims of torture under the illusion of the legitimacy of justice. These commissions are geared and constructed to hide and suppress and to silence victims of torture. They're also designed to ensure impunity and to deny accountability for the torturers themselves. The evidence rules that exist in these military commissions facilitate the admissibility of evidence derived from torture and derived from coercion. Make no mistake about it. And then because if it's we have submitted to you, we have the explicit text of the rules that exist today in the military commissions in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has established a jurisprudential system that indicates that independence of the judiciary is a legitimate function of any tribunal. The courts in Guantanamo Bay, if you could call them that, are far from independent, are far from legitimate, uh, and certainly are ones that should not uh, continue to exist to this day. We understand that the na general nature of this hearing is a thematic inquiry into the conditions in Guantanamo Bay. Myself and my legal team represent one man, Mustafa al Hasawi, and we think that it will be useful throughout our presentation uh, to refer to specific examples, to give you some context into the prism of what the lives of many of these men are currently in Guantanamo Bay. It is items of general applicability that we will discuss, um, but there will be specific examples uh, for your use. We'll find those to be useful. So that you can see, aside from normally prepared statements, what the actual conditions are on the ground in Guantanamo Bay. Currently, um, by our account, there are at 122 remaining detainees in Guantanamo Bay. 15 of those are ones that are called high value detainees. 55 have been cleared for release and yet have been to be released. And 67 are in definite detention, including the 15 high value detainees. The recently released Senate torture report was a 500 page report released by the Senate Intelligence Committee. It was but a snippet and the tip of the iceberg of a much larger 6,000 plus page report, which chronicles the depravity uh, which government agents uh, inflicted upon a number of men who were 
taken into the rendition, detention, and interrogation system. The report itself chronicles a uh, virtual parade of horrors. For instance, in Mr. Al Hasawi's case, it revealed that uh, he was essentially sodomized with rectal examinations that were conducted without evidence of any medical necessity. The aftermath of that torture resulted in hemorrhoids, an anal fissure, and rectal prolapse, which translates into the fact that this man's rectum was torn and shredded based on this conduct. There is indication that there was waterboarding, also water dowsing, sleep deprivation, and adequate medical care and timely medical assistance. But this is not isolated to Mr. Al Hasawi. The Senate Intelligence Report is replete with instances of this torture. And the government's response may very well be that that was then and this is now. Uh, the reality is that Guantanamo Bay continues to be and continues to suppress uh, victims' torture, uh, torture victims' rights to speak, to seek rehabilitation, and to speak about the uh, things that happened to them while they were in confinement. So the question is why does Guantanamo continue to exist and why did it begin in the first place? There are many reasons. As I said, one was to warehouse these individuals for life. Second is a large conspiracy of silence. It is, in effect, a criminal conspiracy, an international criminal enterprise led by United States government agents where millions of dollars exchanged hands. By count, one instance in the Senate Intelligence Committee report indicated that $81 million were paid to the architects of the torture program to devise and to develop the system that was implemented and to use to uh, torture men in Guantanamo, uh, excuse me, men during the retention condition interrogation period at black sites. Today, in Guantanamo, United States government prosecutors continue to take the position that the memories, the impressions, and the experiences of human beings and torture victims, such as Mr. al Hasawi, are classified and belong to the United States government. That means that anything they saw, anything they experienced, and anything they felt continues to be classified. One of the exhibits that we have provided to you for your review is the actual text of the prosecutor's argument in the military commission itself where he has an exchange with the military judge who asked them if the contents of the man's brain are classified. The response was that, in fact, they had him under their possession, and it is their position that, therefore, these facts are classified. These men continue to be denied the right to complain about their torture, the right to seek proper rehabilitation upon their torture, and to receive proper medical treatment and timely medical treatment. Very recently, you've seen in the news a number of instances where they talked about forcible feedings and the ethical dilemma that comes from uh, such feedings. In one particular instance, a United States military member, medical member who refused to participate in such conduct because they believed it to be unethical, was removed from their position and subsequently administratively charged and put through a process of disciplinary uh, issues. This was simply because the person objected uh, based on their ethical medical standards and their guidelines. There is no real independence in medical, uh, in the Guantanamo military commissions and the Guantanamo detention regime today. The Guantanamo military commissions continue to be plagued by ongoing manipulation from external intelligence agencies. In one very well publicized instance, an intelligence agency actually turned off the courtroom itself, turned off the audio and the video feed uh, going to the courtroom in the middle of an open hearing unbeknownst to the judge and unbeknownst to the participants. Very recently, the military prosecutor took the position that men in Guantanamo Bay are not entitled to consular assistance. They're not entitled to meet with their consular representatives because they can watch it on television or watch the proceedings remote viewing, they being the consular representatives, or that they can speak to the attorneys. Certainly, uh, this has never been a position that the State Department um, has supported for when our citizens are uh, sustained abroad or are detained abroad. Uh, certainly such a policy that would only allow us to have access to individuals either through television or viewing them uh, would not be acceptable to us. Nevertheless, it is the position that has been taken in Guantanamo Bay. Finally, the, uh, the system is essentially built, okay, the, the system is essentially built, as I said, to create an atmosphere of silence, uh, to suppress evidence, to deny accountability, and ultimately to ensure a conviction um, and killing of the men who are detained in Guantanamo Bay. Thank you.
afternoon. My name is James Connell. Um, as part of the Office of Defense Counsel, uh, I represent a man named Amar Albalucci, who has been detained at Guantanamo Bay since his transfer from a CIA black site in 2006. I'd like to extend my thanks to the Commission for uh, convening this hearing and my thanks to the United States for participating. I need to provide you a disclaimer that nothing I say represents the position of the United States or the Department of Defense and that nothing is based on information which the United States considers to be classified. The reason that we're here today is that we firmly believe that evidence of a state crime cannot itself be a state secret. Dr. Zanakis, to my left, and I are the only two professionals to visit a client in the secret facility known as Camp 7 at Guantanamo Bay, but we cannot tell you our observations. That limit is simply one example of the many restrictions placed at Guantanamo Bay uh, associated with classification and allegations of national security. Today, I would like to present three witnesses to the commission. First, Special Rapporteur for Torture, Juan Mendez, who could not be here today but has submitted a video statement on the attempts by international human rights bodies to access Guantanamo. Second, Dr. Steven Zanakis on the impact of secrecy on medical treatment at Guantanamo. And third, Melina Malazzo from the Center for Victims of Torture on the impact of secrecy on the attempt to obtain rehabilitation from torture. First, Professor Mendez. Inviting me to this important hearing, and I apologize that I cannot be there physically present. I have been uh, um, in, uh, I have asked uh, the United States government to invite me to visit Guantanamo as early as 2011, when I first became the Special Rapporteur on Torture. Uh, in 2012, uh, the uh, Department of Defense uh, sent me an invitation, but it was on conditions that I was not able to accept because they were the same conditions that had been offered to my predecessors in 2004. The conditions were that I could uh, get a briefing from the authorities of the Guantanamo prison and that they would let me see some parts of the prison, but not all. But very specifically, that I could not have any conversation with any inmate uh, in, in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, as I, I have continued after that to reject those terms, but to insist on a new invitation. But at least as of November of 2014, the official position of the United States is that that is a military prison and that's the only terms that they are able to offer me. Um, I think it's very important to note that the, select, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence has issued an important report uh, on the incidents of torture during the so-called global war on terror. Uh, like the High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights and other uh, fellow special rapporteurs, I have commended the, the, the Senate Committee, Select Committee on Intelligence for uh, not only for issuing this report and publishing it, but also for writing what appears to be a very thorough uh, study. Uh, obviously, only a summary of it is known uh, to the public at this point, so we continue to insist one, that the whole report be uh, published. Uh, second, uh, to point out that telling the truth, um, even if a partial truth like this, is not enough, that the United States is obligated under international law to investigate, prosecute, and punish every instance of torture. And finally, uh, that uh, there are still very, uh, major areas of secrecy that surround the infliction of pain and suffering uh, associated with torture in the global war on terror, including uh, who gave the orders and who executed them. Uh, and it's important for the United States to uh, reveal to the public um, uh, what happened, but also uh, to stop using the state secrets doctrine to impede that access. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a very good hearing. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Steven Zanakis. Uh, thank you so much for the privilege to speak to you, and thanks to our government uh, for its participation. And I affirm the comments by Mr. Connell. 
that detailed information of individuals I have examined at Guantanamo is restricted by the stipulations of the protective order issued by the Department of Defense pertaining to the military commissions and by the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. My public remarks and testimony to the Senate Judiciary Committee in July 2013 have addressed these issues. Secrecy limits the records military physicians receive. A review of the public testimony in the case of Abdul Awarim Hussein Muhammad Al Nashiri discloses that the military psychiatrist evaluating him had to abide by limits on reviewing past medical records and ancillary files. This limitation violates the principles of good medical practice and the ability of a clinician to formulate appropriate diagnosis and treatment plans. Two, secrecy drives a prohibition on independent medical treatment. Medical staff is subordinated to the guards who maintain the primary relationship with the detainees. This arrangement violates the principles of good medical and psychiatric practice that are essential in the management of complicated cases. The detainees regard the environment and command climate at the camps as disrupting any constructive dialogue and possibility of a decent and humane relationship with the authorities. Three. Secrecy deters the military physicians from taking a full history and leads them to ignore obvious explanations. Dr. Vincent Acopino and I published an analysis in 2010 of the medical records and evaluations of detainees. In these records, it was clear that authorities failed to diagnose conditions and illnesses associated with trauma, abuse, and torture including obvious post-traumatic stress disorder and post-concussion syndrome. Only the exceptional record documents a diagnosis of PTSD in detainees with known histories of torture and abusive and harsh interrogations. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Melina Malazzo. I'm Senior Policy Counsel with the Center for Victims of Torture. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak before you. Uh, the Center for Victims of Torture is an international organization dedicating to, he to healing survivors of torture and to work for a world without torture. We provide direct care for those who have been tortured, build the capacity of partners who work to prevent and treat torture, and advocate for an end to torture. We have rehabilitated over 30,000 torture and war trauma survivors since 1985. While the U.S. acknowledges past torture of national security detainees, it fails to adequately address the medical or psychological conditions related to intentional harm. Under the current classification regime, suitable mental health interventions are not possible for Guantanamo detainees. Torture aims to destroy the integrity of a person and eviscerate the sense of self. It seeks to break its victim by imposing intolerable pain often causing long-lasting physical injury and emotional scars. Survivors often feel out of control of their bodies, minds, and emotions. For any healing to occur, physical safety, a sense of personal control, and safety in oneself and one's environment must be established. Similarly, reestablishing trust is essential to recovery. Addressing the intimacy and sadism of the betrayal and violations that occur between two or more human beings under torture is an important component of interventions designed to help torture survivors heal. Finally, survivors are faced with the challenge of speaking the unspeak unspeakable, that is, expressing pain that goes beyond words. Confronting the intolerable pain intentionally inflicted to break someone so that it no longer haunts them through intrusive re-experiencing symptoms like nightmares and flashbacks can assist survivors in their recovery. Safety, trust, and open communication are critical to torture rehabilitation. Classifying Guantanamo detainees' own accounts of ill treatment and everything that flows from that undermine the very foundational pillars of rehabilitation. Thank you. That concludes our presentation. Thank you. 
Ah, okay. Um, can I ask the state to make their presentation, please? You, you were actually um, you had a couple extra minutes, so if necessary, I can give you a couple extra minutes afterwards, depending on what comes up here. Okay. Thank you so much. Distinguished commissioners, secretary, colleagues, friends at the other table, and members of the public. My name is Anthony Pahigan. I'm the alternate representative of the United States Permanent Mission uh, to the Organization of American States. The United States supports the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and its work to protect and promote human rights in this hemisphere. We recognize and applaud the positive impact the Commission has had on the laws and practices in many countries. We are here today at the invitation of the Commission to discuss U.S. military detention operations at U.S. Naval Station Guantanamo Bay. We hope to provide for the Commission's record for those who requested this hearing and for the general public information regarding the detention operations at Guantanamo. The United States would like to state for the record that in light of the fact that this is a thematic hearing under Article 66 of the Commission's rules and not a petition-based hearing under Article 64, the Commission should not refer to the individuals who requested the hearing as petitioners, including on the placard on the table in front of them, nor should it imply that this is an adversarial proceeding. Since 2002, the United States has continuously engaged with the Commission regarding our Guantanamo detention operations as a part of our shared support for transparency and the rule of law in any activities that bear on a government's respect for human rights. I am joined by an interagency team of individuals whose work touches upon the issues that will be discussed today. With me are colleagues from the Department of State and defense. Let me begin by introducing Charles Trumbull, our acting State Department Special Envoy for Guantanamo Closure, Ashika Singh, a Department of State Attorney Advisor for Political Military Affairs, uh, Attorney Advisor Natalia Simeka, uh, Advisor for Human Rights and Refugees, Audrey Shia, a Policy Advisor for the Office of the Special Envoy, and Lieutenant Colonel Lieutenant Colonel Earl Matthews from the Joint Staff as an observer. Thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you, Anthony, and thank you, uh, Commissioners. Uh, it is a pleasure to appear again uh, before this distinguished commission. Commissioners, as you know, the President has repeatedly reaffirmed his commitment to close the Gu Guantanamo Bay detention facility, emphasizing that the continued operation of the facility weakens our national security by draining resources damaging our relationships with key allies and partners, and emboldening violent extremists. We are pleased to provide the Commission with some information regarding a number of positive developments since our last appearance before this Commission to discuss issues related to Guantanamo Bay back in October of 2013. I will discuss e each of these in more depth in just a moment. But to summarize, since the date of our last appearance to discuss Guantanamo, we have transferred a total of 42 detainees. Now, there are only 122 detainees at Guantanamo compared with the 242 who were there when the President first took office. Of these 122, 55 are currently approved for transfer. Second, the Periodic Review Board, otherwise known as the PRB, has continued its work of assessing whether continued law of war detention of certain detainees is necessary to protect against a continuing significant threat to the security of the United States. Since the PRB began its work in October of 2013, it has held full hearings for 13 detainees, as well as three six-month file reviews. We have also seen forward movement in several military commission proceedings that are currently in the pretrial phase, including the referral of charges in June 2014 against Abd al-Hadi al-Iraqi, a senior al-Qaeda commander alleged to have committed a series of offenses in Afghanistan. And there have also been some developments in the Military Commission's process re related to the release of the Executive Summary of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence's report on the CIA's detention and interrogation program. I would also like to emphasize, as we have previously, that the United States is fully committed to ensuring that all detainees are treated humanely and held in accordance with the law. All U.S. Military, military detention operations conducted in connection with armed conflict including at Guantanamo Bay, are carried out in accordance with international 
humanitarian law, including the Geneva Conventions and all other applicable international and domestic law. Now let me return to the issue of detainee transfers and our efforts to close the detention facility at Guantanamo. On this issue, we would first like to take this opportunity to once again extend our sincere thanks to the government of Uruguay for accepting six detainees last year. We would also like to thank Secretary General Insulsa for his statement encouraging other member states to also accept detainees for resettlement. We are committed to closing the facility, but we need the help of our partners and allies to do so. The population at Guantanamo is a small fraction of what it once was. Approximately 80% of those at one time held at Guantanamo Bay have been repatriated or resettled, including all detainees subject to court orders directing their release. Of the 242 detainees held at Guantanamo at the beginning of this administration, 116 have been transferred out of the facility, including, as I mentioned, 42 since our last appearance. 122 detainees again remain at Guantanamo, 55 of whom are designated for transfer. The United States cont continues to pursue vigorously the safe, responsible, and humane transfer of all detainees de designated for transfer, including through intense diplomatic efforts in order to ultimately close the Guantanamo Bay detention facility. Of the 67 detainees who are not currently designated for transfer, 10 are facing charges, awaiting sentencing, or serving criminal sentences. The remaining 57 detainees are eligible for review by the Periodic Review Board. The PRB is a discretionary administrative interagency process. Its role is to determine whether continued law of war detention is necessary for certain detainees at Guantanamo to protect against a continuing significant threat to the security of the United States. As I mentioned earlier, the PRB has conducted full hearings for 13 detainees, as well as three six-month file reviews. The PRB has determined that continued detention of seven of the, det of the detainees reviewed so far is no longer necessary to protect against a significant threat to the United States. Of these seven ind individuals, two have already been repatriated, and the remaining five are eligible for transfer subject to appropriate security and humane treatment assurances and conditions. I'd like to take a second to talk about the military commission proceedings. Alongside our federal courts, military commissions are an appropriate venue for prosecuting Guantanamo detainees. A statutory ban currently prohibits the use of funds to transfer Guantanamo detainees to the United States, even for prosecution in federal court. The United States government remains of the view that in our efforts to protect our national security, military commissions and federal courts can, depending on the circumstances of the specific prosecution, each provide tools that are both effective and legitimate. All current military commission proceedings at Guantanamo incorporate fundamental procedural guarantees that meet or exceed the fair trial safeguards required by common Article 3 and other applicable law and are consistent with those in additional Protocol 2 to the 1949 Geneva Conventions. These measures include, or these uh, safeguards include, one, innocence is presumed and the prosecution must prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Two, there is a prohibition on the admission of any statement obtained by the use of torture or by cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment in military commission proceedings, except against a person accused of torture or such treatment as evidence that the statement was made. Three, the accused has latitude in selecting defense counsel. Four, in capital cases, the accused is provided counsel, quote, learned in applicable law relating to capital cases, end quote. And five, the accused has the right to pretrial discovery. The 2009 Military Commissions Act also provides for the right to appeal final judgments rendered by a military commission to the U.S. Court of Military Commission Review and to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. That court is a federal civilian court consisting of life tenure judges. Uh, judgments can also be ultimately appealed to the United States Supreme Court. I would also like to provide a brief update uh, to provide the following update on Commission's proceedings. 
The military commissions convened to try the defendants charged with the attacks on the USS Cole and on the United States of America on September 11, 2001, have continued with pretrial litigation. In each case, more than 300 motions have been filed by the defendants challenging the structure of the commissions, the admissibility of evidence at trial, and constitutional questions, among other matters. On June 2, 2014, a third case was referred to trial by military commission. The charges against Iraqi citizen Abd al-Hadi al-Iraqi include denying quarter, attacking protected property, perfidy, and attempted perfidy. This case was referred to a commission that is not authorized to issue a capital sentence following a guilty verdict. A mid-level Al-Qaeda member convicted of a facilitating role in a terrorist bombing in El Mukalla Harbor of Yemen in 2002 will be sentenced now or between now and sometime on or before 2016. And finally, another mid-level Al-Qaeda member convicted of a facilitating role in a terrorist bombing in Jakarta, Indonesia in 2003 will be sentenced by early next year under a plea agreement that sets the remaining time of confinement at an additional 15 to 21 years. The explosion in Jakarta killed 11 people and injured more than 80 others, with the United States citizens among the injured. I'd also like to give a couple remarks on the right to challenge detention. Separately from the military commission proceedings, all detainees at Guantanamo have the ability to challenge the lawfulness of their military detention in U.S. federal court through a petition for a writ of habeas corpus. The detainees may submit written statements and provide live testimony at their hearings via video link. The United States has the burden in these cases to establish its legal authority to hold the detainees by a preponderance of the evidence. Many of the detainees at Guantanamo today have challenged their detention in U.S. federal courts. All of the detainees at Guantanamo who have prevailed in habeas proceedings under orders that are no longer subject to appeal have been either repatriated or resettled. To date, 32 detainees have been ordered released and transferred from Guantanamo pursuant to U.S. federal court orders. This has brought me to the conclusion of my remarks, and I will now turn it over to my colleague, Ashika Singh. Thank you very much, uh, esteemed commissioners, other participants and observers. It's my pleasure to be here today. I would like to briefly address some points that were raised about the release of the executive summary, um, the redacted and declassified executive summary of the Senate Select Committee's um, study of the CIA's detention and interrogation program. Uh, specifically with respect to developments in the military commissions related to the release of that executive summary, I would note that upon release, the unredacted portions of the executive summary, which is the vast majority of the document um, that had been classified, were declassified. As a result of this declassification, it's expected to accelerate the provision of relevant information to the defense, and it increases the likelihood that more of the processes by which the defense presents evidence of post-capture treatment will be open to the public, where these matters can be publicly discussed. Uh, in this way, declassification has further shown that the military commissions are not designed, as some have alleged, to foreclose government conduct from public view. For example, just recently on February 20th, 2015, the commissions in the al-Nashiri and 9-11 conspirators cases granted the prosecution's motion to issue a second amended protective order number one governing this information, um, the declassified information from the executive summary. The amendments to the protective order reflect this release and declassification. Uh, as those of you who have seen the report will notice, 93% uh, of the public report is entirely declassified. Um, they these amendments to the protective order remove the restrictive handling requirements for certain formerly classified information related specifically to the enhanced interrogation techniques applied to the accused and to the description of the accused conditions of confinement in the detention interrogation program. Additionally, on February 18th, 2015, as the Chief Prosecutor of the Military Commissions has already publicly announced, the uh, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence authorized the Office of the Chief Prosecutor to review the full study, the full report, um, and the prosecution has begun its efforts to review the full study for potentially discoverable information. Thanks, Ashika. 
We hope the information that we've provided here today uh, will help the Commission gain a more complete understanding of the current situation at Guantanamo. The United States will continue our efforts, both within the Commission and more broadly, to be transparent in its detention operations at Guantanamo, including in explaining specific practices and policies and the situation of those individuals who are detained. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to be to present this information today, and we look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will ask the country rapporteur to speak to the issue of Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you very much, Madam President, and good afternoon <coughs> to both delegations. Um, this is an issue that the Commission has been following from the very beginning when the um, center of detention in Guantanamo Bay was open. There have been a number of hearings. I don't have the exact account here, but uh, around 10 hearings, uh, either general ones uh, as this one, uh, other on, on specific cases, and some on precautionary measures. Um, the Commission, uh, in the same way than the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, has asked the United States government to visit uh, Guantanamo uh, and has received the same response than the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. That is that uh, it would not be allowed to freely interview the persons uh, in prison there, which is not acceptable for the Commission. It has not been accepted by the Commission throughout its it, it history in the, in the countries of the OAS, including at the time of the dictatorships in Latin America. So it would not be acceptable now either. Uh, and that's the reason the Commission has not been able to conduct a visit to Guantanamo. Um, the Commission nonetheless uh, issued many years ago uh, precautionary measures uh, who benefit, which benefit the, the persons in prison in Guantanamo Bay. And um, that measure has not been uh, uh, implemented by the government of the United States. Um, this uh, precautionary measure benefits all the persons who are in detention there. Um, on the other hand, the Commission is preparing uh, a general report about the situation of uh, Guantanamo, uh, which will follow up our statements that the Commission has done over the years. And, um, <clears throat> and I would like to stress that the Commission um, praised uh, the uh, government of President Obama, when at first uh, uh, he announced that uh, uh, the Guantanamo Bay uh, Detention Center would be closed uh, in 2009, uh, but uh, the Commission has become disappointed that that has not been fulfilled. There have been some uh, steps uh, in that direction, in the direction of uh, freeing some of the prisoners, but in fact uh, it has taken very, very long and the uh, Center has been offered for more than 12 years now. Um, one of the hearings that the Commission had on, on Guantanamo was also about this issue that uh, has been discussed here, here, about the need to redress the allegations of torture there. Uh, this took place in 2009, according to my own recollection. So it's not the first time that the Commission visits this in a general, ma in a general way, but it's important to gather um, updated information on this. Now, um, <clears throat> some specific matters. Uh, on the one hand, the, the petitioners, not petitions for in a case, but petitioners of the hearing, um, stated that uh, statements uh, derived from torture uh, are being used to prosecute uh, um, persons at the Guantanamo Center. This was disputed by the U.S. government. Um, I would like to hear more from both sides to have a clear picture about this matter. And the second point is uh, I would like to ask the government about this uh, uh, allegation presented by the petitioners of the hearing that uh, there is uh, limitations, there are limitations to the documentation uh, that they can uh, have to prepare legal defenses. Thank you. Commissioner Ortiz. Muchas gracias. Por mi parte, también agradezco mucho a los peticionarios y peticionarias de esta audiencia pública 
igualmente a las autoridades por las informaciones proporcionadas. Y quisiera simplemente tocar un aspecto en relación a la tortura y en relación a lo que mencionaron de que la clasificación socava los pilares de la rehabilitación. ¿Qué pasos piensan dar para que la rehabilitación de las víctimas de tortura eh, no se vea impedida por esta medida de la clasificación? También quisiera eh, preguntarles dos cosas concretas. Es con relación a los detenidos yemeníes en particular. ¿Qué pasos recientes, recientes ha tomado el gobierno para evaluar la situación de los yemeníes caso por caso? Y en segundo lugar, ¿cuándo estimarían ustedes que todos los detenidos hayan tenido una audiencia ante el Periodic Review Board? Muchas gracias. I would like to give our assistant, our deputy uh, executive secretary, an opportunity to speak. She has a long institutional history and memory on this issue, Elizabeth uh, Ami Meshed. Thank you, Madam President. It's um, a follow up question about classification, um, following up on what Ms. Singh was mentioning, if I have the name correct. And in particular, um, I understand now that the chief prosecutor is able to review the full study now of the Senate uh, Select uh, Committee's report. And I wondered if it would be possible to understand whether there's a timeline for that, what the criteria are for maintaining classification or declassifying, and then what would be the process in place to enable defense counsel to have access to certain information that would come out of what you called um, potentially discoverable information. So I wanted to see if I understood that process. Um, and any comments from the petitioners, of course. Thank you, Madam President. Yes, I would also like to underscore um, the comments of my colleagues, in particular the record that was um, that my colleague, Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez, gave about how, how long the commission has been monitoring. And yes, we do acknowledge some progress, but there's still a lot more to be done. There's no doubt this has been a blot on the human rights record of the United States, and we all understand the complications. Um, I wondered whether for the remaining 67 um, prisoners, is there some sort of road map uh, into do, do we know that when is the end game? Is it still sort of in limbo? Do we have any sort of definite information as to that? You said they are up for review. Is it soon? What is there any more information about that that can be given? And I too, um, I was struck by the differences, the core of the complaint of the petitioners uh, on this particular occasion, apart from the general horror of the situation, was about lack of information and not being able to uh, uh, address or redress the violations that had gone before for persons who still needed um, redress, the impact of the torture, etc., and the lack of information. So it, it was struck that I was struck that it seems as though they still don't have access, despite what um, the government is saying about declassification. So I wondered whether it, is it that people are not aware? Are there impediments to, 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 to this notion of declassification? And why still this cloak of, of, of silence on the issue? Um, as I said, you, you didn't take up all of your time. So you do have, maybe we can say, five minutes or so um, to give us even more information and to respond, especially to the issues uh, that we have raised here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam President. We will uh, split the time between ourselves. Actually, I can be a little more generous if you need it. Thank you very do much. You, um, do you need eight minutes? That'd be great. Okay, eight thank minutes. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, um, with respect to um, your question about um, evidence that is uh, utilized, that has uh, evidence derived from torture, that's a very good question uh, that you ask. Um, it is true that what the United States position is, is, is that no evidence obtained through the use of torture will be uh, presented. Uh, I will direct your attention to Exhibit 6 of our submission. Exhibit 6 of our submission uh, references three rules that exist in the military commission's rules of evidence as of right now. 
Uh, they are the rules that uh, govern the admissibility of evidence. Those rules allow for the admissibility of evidence, and here's the key word, derived from torture. So what, uh, what typically happens is you hear a very eloquent semantics game. Um, there will be no evidence obtained through the use of torture, but the rules provide for evidence derived from the use of torture, as well as from coercion. So if you actually look at the text of the rules that govern these military commissions, uh, the reality is undeniable that evidence derived from torture can be admissible as well as evidence that is derived from coercion. The rules of hearsay and for admissibility of hearsay evidence are also lower than the normal standards in Article I courts, excuse me, in Article III courts. That rule is also referenced for you in tab six of our exhibit for your review, so you can read that for yourself. The question then becomes, of course, what evidence is derived from torture? Where does the torture stop and where does the free flow of evidence begin? What the government wants to do is to say that torture stopped on a particular date and thereafter everything else was cleansed, uh, cleansed of that torture. And of course this is, a, this is a logical impossibility for anyone who understands what happens when a person is tortured. With the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee's report you have seen some of the depravity. So to draw such an arbitrary line and yet maintain these kinds of rules is, is a very eloquent semantics game but it, the reality is otherwise with respect to that. In terms of the uh, moving on to uh, the question about uh, the impediments to uh, relating what happened to these men, um, the way the government has gone about doing this is they've classified the memories, the thoughts, and the experiences of the individuals. Therefore, they're not allowed to speak to you as a body, to the Convention Against Torture, the Committee Against Torture. They're not allowed to seek uh, redress from organizations that would uh, help them to be rehabilitated because the government's position, as was stated by their prosecutor in Guantanamo Bay, is that their very memories, their thoughts, their recollections and experiences are classified and therefore cannot be utilized outside of the very controlled environment of the military commissions. Therefore, if they are not able to relate their horrific accounts of what happened to them, how can they then seek redress and rehabilitation? We filed a motion before the military commissions on the Convention Against Torture, and the ruling was that there were no independent rights for these men who had been victimized or tortured that would be recognized. Even though we weren't asking the court to recognize a cause of action before a U.S. court, but to allow them to seek redress internationally or through other organizations that would prosecute those claims. In our client's case, um, he's been denied access to mail. Um, independent legal organizations who would prosecute those claims internationally have been denied access to him. Um, and so what, what is six is virtually um, an absence of communications for him. And now let Mr. Connell continue. Thank you. Uh, the United States maintained today that it has acted consistently with its international obligations. And it has always maintained that it acts consistently with those obligations, but that the detainees themselves have no independent enforceable rights on either the, under the Geneva Conventions, under the Convention Against Torture, or against the Vienna Convention. And every effort within the military commission structure to obtain relief, such as the ability to make a report to the Special Rapporteur, the ability to sign a pleading to this commission, or the ability to receive a consular visit has been denied, not because, not on the merits, but because the military commissions maintain that it does not even have authority to address these complaints. The United States position uh, has consistently prevailed in the military commissions, and the commission has awarded uh, no rights and ordered no redress. The there were two questions, both from Commissioner Gonzalez and from the uh, President of the Commission, about the limitations on documents and the, and the impediments to receiving information. Uh, Mr. Ruiz and I, as well as other uh, defense counsel in the commissions, hold some of the highest security clearances issued by the United States government. Notwithstanding that and the fact that we have been representing these men for three or more years, we have received no information about the treatment of these men in CIA custody. 
with only one minor exception. The, uh, we have heard about the issuance of the redacted executive summary of the Senate torture report, which was a positive step. The full report, uh, 6,000 pages long, is based on 6 million documents produced by the CIA for review by the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. In total, in three years, the uh, prosecution has produced uh, 160 pages of redacted medical records uh, regarding uh, to me, his counsel, uh, regarding the treatment of uh, my client, Mr. Abalucci, in CIA custody. No information about where, by whom, what interrogation methods were used, um, or uh, what the conditions of confinement were like uh, in the more than three years that he was in CIA custody. The, to discuss the limitations on documents, the, in the military commissions, all document flow to the defense is, made, is governed by the prosecution. There was a time when, uh, as uh, security clearance holders, we had access to ordinary flows of classified information uh, through the systems, but the Department of Defense has removed all of our access outside of the prosecution to any information. In other words, for the most part, the Defense Council and the military commissions have the same access to information as the general public. The uh, last question that I want to specifically address is with respect to um, uh, Commissioner Ortiz's question, I think directed to the government, but about rehabilitation. Uh, Mr. Albulucci, my particular client, has consistently sought uh, to obtain rehabilitation services for the torture that he has suffered. Uh, the, all of our applications to uh, major torture rehabilitation services have been declined for the reason that those, serv those organizations do not feel that they can ethically address torture rehabilitation for a person who does not have safety and security and who cannot communicate with them freely about their torture. They feel that it simply presses their, eth it's, it's unethical for them to cooperate in torture rehabilitation under those services. And I respect their position, uh, which is principled and, um, and helps to maintain the many other valuable torture rehabilitation services that they provide. The um, final thing that I would like to say is that the, um, there is some effort underway in the military commissions to reduce the categories of classified information. Uh, it is not in fact accurate that the 9-11 Military Commission has acted upon the request to um, declassify some information, um, but we do hope that that will occur in the relatively near future. The practical effect that, that remains to be seen, and the new amended protective order that the United States referred to would maintain a series of classification restrictions on defense counsel and on these detainees themselves that uh, will prevent accountability, such as what countries the uh, abuse took place in, who was involved in the abuse, that is, in short, who should be held accountable. The last uh, point that should be made on that is that the, in the district of uh, D.C., where the habeas uh, jurisdiction lies in the case, they continue to suffer under the idea of presumptive classification. That is, that every word uttered by the deta a detainee at Guantanamo Bay continues to be classified. Thank you for your attention. The state would like to make a few more comments. Yes, uh, thank you very much for those additional comments. Uh, I wanted to first address the issue of uh, the potential use of evidence uh, obtained or derived from torture in the Commission's proceedings. And I want to be very clear that there is an explicit statutory ban. The Military Commissions Act of 2009 expressly forbids the introduction of a statement obtained by torture or by cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment, except against a person accused of torture or such treatment as evidence that the statement was made. The Chief Prosecutor, I know know is, is committed to strictly policing and enforcing that prohibition. And as to whether there is some sort of semantic distinction in the rules that would nevertheless allow that sort of evidence in, I, I would like to reaffirm that voluntariness is the touchstone of admissibility of statements in the military commission's process. The military judge will consider the totality of the circumstances when evaluating whether a statement is voluntarily given, including as appropriate 
the details of the taking of the statement, including any interrogation methods used, the characteristics of the accused, such as military training, age, and education, the lapse in time, change of place, or change in identity of the questioners between the statement sought to be admitted and any prior questioning of the accused. And um, with respect to the review by the prosecution of the entire Senate study and the, Secretary, uh, the Executive Secretary's question on that, um, I would have to defer to the prosecution as to the specifics. Unfortunately, they weren't able to join us here today. Um, I'm sure that, the, I know that the review is underway and that the Chief Prosecutor, I'm sure, will be making additional public statements as it progresses and will be communicating with Defense Counsel um, as appropriate to coordinate the production or release of any additional information. I can provide some information generally on this issue of classified information um, in the proceedings and classified handling requirements. Uh, those rules are, are set out in the Military Commissions Act. It also, it sets out rules for discovery and use of classified information, which are actually modeled on the procedures governing the discovery and use of classified information in federal court. Uh, in the military commissions, like other U.S. courts, the discovery obligations are governed by the rules of procedure and the interpretation of those obligations by the judge. So under the Military Commissions Act and its implementing rules, the accused is entitled to discovery of classified information if the military judge determines that the information would be non-cumulative, relevant, and helpful to a legally cognizable defense, rebuttal of the prosecution's case, or to sentencing in accordance with standards generally applicable to discovery of or access to classified information in federal criminal cases. The judge regulates what and how much discovery the government must provide to counsel, and in situations involving national security information, the judge must approve appropriate substitutes for the discovery. In the event that the military judge determines the substitutes insufficient, he or she may issue sanctions, including holding the case in abeyance. I would now like to turn to my colleague, Charlie Trumbull, to address a couple of the additional points raised. Hey, I can, uh, okay, I can quickly address um, a question about, uh, about the Yemeni population. Um, of the 122 detainees, uh, 75 are from Yemen. And of the 55 detainees who are proof or transfer, 47 are from Yemen. So this is obviously a significant uh, focus for us, but it's also a challenge. Uh, the commissioners are, are well aware of the situation in Yemen. Um, it's it's uh, very fragile, and it's very difficult to send these individuals back to Yemen, uh, given the instability there. Uh, so what we our focus is on resettling these to other countries, and we have been successful recently. In in the past uh, few months, we've resettled 11 Yemeni nationals, uh, uh, four to Oman, uh, one to Estonia, uh, three to Kazakhstan, and three to Georgia. Um, and so this is one of the challenges of finally closing Guantanamo, is that we need countries. Uh, who are willing to accept these individuals who can't go back to their home country due to the security or humane treatment concerns there. And so that's why we're reaching out to our friends and allies. Um, there was also uh, a question about when we will complete uh, the periodic review board hearings for all of the uh, detainees. And expediting the PRB process is a key priority uh, for the administration, and we understand that it's, it's very important in our overall efforts to close Guantanamo. Uh, so there have been a number of uh, very high-level discussions uh, concerning how to expedite this process, and, and I think we are uh, definitely going to be doing that. Uh, you've seen already the pace has, has picked up in 2015. We've had four hearings this year, and I, I think it's my very sincere uh, hope, and I think this can happen, that all of the remaining individuals who are eligible for a hearing will have one in the next uh, 12 months or so. Um, and finally, uh, you asked about uh, uh, the remaining 57 individuals who are not currently approved for transfer. And again, the, the periodic review board is, is the key to that. Um, every detainee uh, who's not facing criminal charges and uh, who's not already approved for transfer will receive a periodic review board hearing at least once every three years. And in between that three-year period, if they're not approved for transfer, they receive a file review every six months. So we're constantly assessing them, constantly looking at whether they can continue to pose a threat uh, to the United States of America. And if they, if they don't, then we are going to look to transfer them. Thank you. Thank you. That brings to the close uh, this hearing uh, on Guantanamo Bay. The Commission will continue to monitor the situation. It remains one of very grave concern to the Commission, as evidenced by the number of hearings and press releases that we have um, 
put out on this issue. Thank you to the United States um, government for attending and for all of the petitioners. And we, as always, welcome any documentation. Bye-bye.